there are so many resources now where you could just go to puzzles, click on mate in one. You can literally filter puzzles by mate in one and you solve 50 of them. Do that for a week and imagine how much better you're gonna become at recognizing these patterns, right? So a lot of the time that people, I think, get confused about, about training, right? About, about what they need to do to get to the next level. The, the answer is just to, to solve, right? And the rest is just going to come because I think the, the misconception people think, well, I don't know a key fact or a key way of thinking that is preventing me from getting to the next level. That's why I'm wondering. But often the reason isn't that you don't know something, it's that you don't know how to apply it and you just gotta give yourself more practice, okay? Let's play 1e4 in the next game. We're playing 480 and e4, e5. So there are many options, many options for aggressive and good gambits for beginners. I'll talk about the philosophy of that in uh, after the game. One such gambit is the Danish gambit. The Danish gambit is where you play d4, immediately striking in the center. They take the pawn, normally they take the pawn. And then queen takes d4 is the center game. It's an, not a very good opening. But the Danish Gambit is playing the move C2 to C3. What is the Zen of the Danish Gambit? Most Gambits sacrifice one or more pawns. The Danish Gambit sacrifices two pawns in order to get a lead in development. A lead in development just means you get more of your pieces out than your opponent. Than your opponent. And Gambits are more are our mentality, right? To play a Gambit, you need to have a certain mentality where you are ready to sacrifice, if necessary, a pawn. If necessary, more than that, to to get a lead in development to play with the initiative. So you have to be fond of aggressive play. Now here, black declines the gambit, black plays c5. Decline gambit is when your opponent refuses to take the pawn that you have offered him. So he plays the move c7 to c5. That's not a bad move actually, um, but it's not a great move either. The reason it's not a great move is partially because he blocks the bishop from developing to c5 um, and he creates a weakness on d5. And I'll define the term afterward, but essentially, in short, empty chairs, thanks for the prime, a weak square is a square that cannot be defended by a pawn, okay? That's a pretty simple definition, actually. Um, and the d5 square cannot be defended by any pawn because the, the e pawn is now on d4 and the c pawn is on c5. It doesn't go backwards. Now, how can we develop with an eye toward immediately claiming this d5 square? Uh, we can take on d4, but let's put on that gambit hat. We don't need to take on d4. We're ready to sacrifice the pawn. Bingo, bishop c4. It's not the best move. If he plays well, he can respond to this well, but it's, it's a very thematic move that sets up a lot of attacking ideas. And again, remember the gambit mentality. The gambit mentality means that you don't necessarily care about each individual pawn. You are focusing um, more, much more on a piece development than on, on individual pawns. So you guys might see, well, he's threatening the e4 pawn. Maybe I should go in knight d2 or queen e2. But I'm thinking about this much differently. It's very simple. You just go knight f3. That's that's how you normally develop. Five bucks from Rogue Force. Thank you so much. Knight e4. How do we maximize our development? And he's playing this very well, by the way. Like the way that I'm playing, black will be better if he plays like a GM with full due respect to Mesril, <laughs> he's not a GM. We castle. See, and at the heart of aggressive play, when you hear that aggressive play, gambit play, is actually a very sound command of the fundamentals. And when I say fundamentals, I mean things like proper development, proper piece placement, and knowing when to put aside material considerations for more important things like rapid development. Now, Black's best move here would be d7 to d5, immediately hitting the bishop. Not an easy move for some, you know, for a beginner to find. Um, but so far, he's impressed me with his play. Now, I, I do need to address the question of cheating and stuff. We will definitely encounter some cheaters in the pool. That there's no question about it. The key and what I always ask of you guys is A, to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I'm not going to stand for any accusations before we carefully investigate the game, even if it's obvious, um, because 
we owe that to people in case they actually are underrated or play well. But let's keep things positive, even if we do face a cheater. That's the sort of important thing here. Okay, so um, what do we do now? He's played a6, that's sort of a, a waste of a move. But we know that black does wanna play d5, right? Black wants to play d5, which would open up the bishop. It would attack our bishop and it would control more of the center. And the move rookie one is incredibly tempting. I get it. But black can still play d5 in response to rookie one. If I go rookie one, imagine this. Black plays d5, and he defends the knight in addition to attacking the bishop. So the obvious follow-up is, well, let's put a bishop on d5. But there is another way to approach this. Rather than putting a bishop on d5, you can try to control this square. And that can be a lot more conducive to your general plan. Think about it that way. What comes to mind? Can we control d5 and perhaps add on to this bishop? Well, the concept of a battery comes into play here. We go queen to b3. Pretty common move in Danish gambit-related positions. Stack up the bishop and the queen, and guess what? We're already threatening a devastating check on f7. You guys see how that's more effective, right, than playing bishop d5, which would send his knight back. That's all it would do. And I know I would never find that. I would push back on phrases like that because... As corny as it sounds, you know, you have to believe in your ability to find stuff and, you know, to apply logic. And most of these moves can be found with logic in b5. So a6, my opponent, he intended b5. He doesn't properly put this into context. He allows bishop f7 check. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about the specific moves afterward. Okay, so king is, king is, this is not checkmate. King e7 is still possible. And these are positions where particularly beginners really struggle. It's like you can sense that very close to delivering checkmate. You need to rein things in. Um, so after king e7, let's wait for him to play it. How should we approach this position? Well, there's a couple of things here. Um, and, I, and I've mentioned this in the five minute speedrun many times. Observations are at the heart of finding the vast majority of s s correct tactical solutions in most positions. So before we say any moves, let's make the proper observations. What do I even mean by making observations? Well, there's a couple of things. There are tactical patterns, right? And by tactical patterns, I mean things like king and the queen on the same diagonal. We see that here. Those can alert you to the presence of various tactics like bishop g5. Now, is bishop g5 good here? Yes or no? Is it, does it win the queen? It does... Not win the queen, because knight takes g5, and that's not what we want. The other thing that you have to look for is undefended pieces. Pieces that are not protected by pawns or other pieces. And I'll expand on that later, but undefended pieces can be the, the sort of guidepost for, for various things like forks and double attacks. So we see the knight on e4 is clearly undefended. The rook on a8 is clearly undefended. He has exposed that rook by playing b7 and b5. So while everybody wants to play rook e1, and that's a decent move, queen to d5 is what I would actually play in a game. But because, you know, we're doing the speed run, I'm going to play rook e1. That's a simpler move. It does have one flaw, and I will show that flaw after the game. If black finds this, kudos to him. Now, we're still much better. No, I'm not giving up the advantage or anything like that. Um, does anybody see what black should do here? How, yes, c4, very nice. c4 intercepts the connection between the queen and the bishop. And that's the flaw. Let's see if he finds it. And he does. Very nice. He finds it. Um, okay. So, don't worry. Everything is under, I saw this. And how do we go about thinking about this position? Well, um, you know, we messed up. That's okay. And I, you know, we didn't literally mess up. But how do you think about the situation? Well, you need to make the most out of the situation. Uh, because if you take the knight, then he's going to take the, the bishop. So if we're already losing the bishop, if we're already losing it, what should we do? We should take the pawn. We should at least take something out with us. That concept, by the way, is, is very often misunderstood. Right? If you've already come to terms with losing a piece, then that's called a desperado sacrifice. You give the piece up for as much as you can get in return. 
Um, now, there's a lot going on here. There's actually a lot of complicated tactics. I didn't anticipate this in our second game, but that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. There's a lot of cool stuff here that I can unpack after the game. Now, we need to be very careful, and I'll explain that one. It's very complicated. If we play, if we play queen takes c4, say, oh, this knight's not going anywhere, black's going to play d5. So first, we need to take the knight. And again, we need to be very careful. He's probably going to go king f7. Particularly the move, like, I, I know all of you guys are seeing bishop g5. Why doesn't this win the queen? The bottom line is he's attacking my queen. So we get into a situation where both queens are hanging. And that's a very complicated situation. Now, it's time for bishop g5 check. But after king to g6, we're not going to take his queen yet. Because our queen is also hanging. So why did we play bishop g5 in the first place? Well, it's good that we're attacking his queen. We'll be able to move our queen. That's another situation where people often make mistakes. Well, not queen b6 because he's defending that square. Okay, so what do we do? So queen takes c4. Yeah, the, the best thing that you can do, and he still can go d5 and attack your queen. It's amazing how many resources black has here, but we're still winning it. The thing is, um, when two queens are hanging, that's one of the most tactically charged situations in chess. What do you need to look for? What you need to look for is, can I move my queen away with check? If you do so, the king moves, and then we're free to take his queen, which is what happened here. The problem is that black could have gone d5 and attacked the queen at the same time. And, and that led to very cool tactical complications. Okay, so when you're first starting chess... Um, and this is why I'm a little bit nervous that we reached position this. I don't want to paint the wrong image to beginners of like, oh, you, you plunge into this super complex web of variations. You need to focus on the fundamentals, on, on adhering to opening principles and stuff like that. The variations are less important. They're fun. I'll show them, but they're less important. So what should we do now? How do we get to this king? Well, maybe we can give a check on f7. No, we can't. King takes f7. What other pieces can jump into the attack? Well, we look at our rook, it's near the king. We look at our knight, can we go knight e5? Well, then he would take the knight. We can go knight h4, maybe, but rook g4 is the sort of most obvious move. Yeah, rook g4, that completes the rook lift, actually. And rook g4 is a check to the king. The king can't go back to f7. Queen is covering that square. Bishop is covering f6, right? Just methodically considering where the king can go and where it can't go, it got, it's going to f5. Now, a lot of people here... And I think, you know, beginners have this issue, obviously, not because they're dumb, but because it's natural to have this issue. The issue of reflex moves, right? So king f5, you see the rook is hanging. So I know that a lot of you are thinking rook g5 check. I, I know it. But there is a mate that's faster. Because remember, you are in a king hunt. So when you're hunting the king, <laughs> you're hunting the king, you often have to sacrifice pieces using them as deco as lures to lure the king further into your camp. So this g4 rook can be just such a lure. Let's think logically. After king takes g4, from what square, let's assume that the king is on g4. From what square does the queen deliver checkmate to the king? Where do we need to put the queen given that the king is on g4? Well, you guys, you guys are seeing g5 is one that comes to mind. How do we get it there? We can't play queen c5, that drops the queen to the bishop. Just the queen d5. That's also not the fastest mate. There was a mate in two. I'll show that after the game. Queen f7 check. He can play knight e5 and it's mate in three. Or actually, no. Yeah, yeah, it is mate in three. But now, queen g5 is checkmate. Okay. Um, good game. Let's go over. Um, and yeah, so the Danish gambit is uh, what we attempted to play. We sort of failed. Um, and he takes d4. Yeah, we're two out of two are awesome. He takes d4, c3. A little bit of history. Now, the Danish Gambit is a very old opening. It's, uh, it's been around for a very long time. If you guys want to know exactly when it was first mentioned, I have a book for that. Give me a second. Some chess history. Never hurt anybody. This move, c3, I'll check with a first mention later was played for the first time in 1839 by Evans, William Davies Evans in London. 
And his opponent played knight, C, knight f6, so his opponent declined uh, declined the Danish Gambit. I'm, I'm not sure why it's called the Danish Gambit. Definitely had something to do with Denmark. I'll investigate that later. Um, and our opponent played the move c5, which is a legitimate move. It's, it's occurred in 49 games. And it's been played by some good players. Um, but the accepted Danish Gambit is obviously d takes c3, right? And now you guys might assume that white is supposed to play knight takes c3. But the cool thing about the Danish is you don't take this pawn back. You go bishop c4. <laughs> and the first time that the Danish Gambit was played in this version... The first time, according to my records, that this position occurred was 1863 by a guy named Hans Linden, who was apparently a master, and he was apparently the first person to have this on the board in 1863. Um, and the city of Copenhagen played a club match against the city of Uppsala in Sweden in 1875. That may be where it got its name. Uh, Hans Niemann's great-great-grandfather, yes. Um, in any case... That may be where it gets sustained. Funny thing is Copenhagen lost that game. Anyways, what is the idea of the Danish Gambit? Well, just look at it with your eyes. You have both of your bishops developed, and they're both aimed in the vicinity of the king. So even without analyzing a single variation, you can already kind of understand why this Gambit exists and why it can be dangerous, right? Uh, hopefully that makes sense. We won't analyze it right now. I'm sure that we'll get a chance to play it, and then we'll kind of analyze it properly. So c5 is what my opponent played. Now bishop c4. So weak squares, I've, as I've defined them, are squares that cannot be defended by pawns. But you have to be very careful about this definition. Very careful about this definition. Because by that token, you might look, well, okay, Daniel said that weak squares are squares that are not defended, not possible to defend, by, not possible to defend by pawns. That is, it doesn't mean, like for example, uh, b, uh, a4. Is A4 a weak square by our definition? No, because white can play the move B3, even though white hasn't yet. Does that make sense? Now, the thing is, it's called the classical era of modern chess. Not all weak squares are important. So by our definition, D6 is also a weak square. But is it likely that white is going to get a knight onto D6 anytime soon? I mean, white will have to go here and here and here, and black's bishop defends that square. I would say it's pretty unlikely that that's going to happen anytime soon. The d5 square is very important because we are literally controlling it immediately with our bishop. So you've got to be very, very uh, sort of discerning in how you approach the question of weak squares. A square could be weak, but that could be just about as important as, you know, a white, white grade you got on AP Calc. Um, not important, you know, or it could be as important as, um, you know, what Grady got on AP English. Very important, right? So you have to be discerning when it comes to weak squares. I'll talk more about this later. Thank you, Slow Air, for gifting this code mail. Okay, so knight f6, and now the move knight f3, right? Uh, getting the knight out and uh, putting the emphasis on development. Um, yeah. Knight takes e4 and castle. And this is what I would call the gambit mentality, right? This ability to constantly prioritize development over winning pawns back. If I were to play how I would actually play against another grandmaster, I would play c takes d4. I would, um, you know, I, I would take the pawn back and then I would go knight f3 and win the pawn back and I'd have a slight advantage, hey, Bruja. But that's not what I'm doing here. Um, so... A lot of people here would say, well, wh why can't you play queen e2? Who can explain that to me? Why, why, is queen e why doesn't this win the knight? I mean, this clearly pins the knight. Why doesn't it win the knight? Because black has the move d7 to d5. I mentioned this during the game. It's better than queen e7 because this gets the bishop out. It attacks white's bishop and it protects the knight. It, it kills so many things with one stone, right? Okay, um, so castles, a6 is the first mistake. Instead, black should have played d5. Then I would have given a check with the bishop. And at that point, I would have had no choice but to recover at least one of the pawns I've sacrificed. But black can very quickly get his pieces out. C takes d4, bishop e7, and then black castles. Black will be up a pawn. So it's still double-edged, but black is doing well here, right? Uh, so instead, my opponent plays a6. 
which is sort of a classic violation of the opening principle, which says that you should control the center and develop your pieces. If you're not doing either of those things, it better be for a very good reason. And preparing b5 is not a very good reason. So queen b3 is the move that we played in response. Controlling the d5 square, building a battery and attacking f7. Does this, the logic behind this move make sense? Now, a lot of you guys suggested putting the bishop on d5. And the problem with that move is that black would have played knight f6, attacking the bishop. And here's the interesting thing. Some of you guys may be looking at this knight and saying, well, this knight is annoying. I want to get rid of this knight. I'm looking at this knight. I'm saying, I love the fact that that knight is on e4. But wait a second, isn't this knight in the center? Isn't it a bad thing for us when our opponent has his pieces in the center? Well, then you would be thinking about it too generally, right? The knight is undefended. And not only is it undefended, his king is still in the center. So the knight is a, uh, is a magnet for all of these tactics that involve explaining an undefended piece. Does that make sense? So just because a piece is in the center doesn't mean it's good. It would become good if black plays d5. And that is why we don't force the knight out of e4 on our own volition. Instead, we control um, and prevent a move that could secure and anchor that knight to the center. Queen b3, b5, bishop f7, and rook e1. So instead of rook e1, the move queen d5 was far more convincing. Attacking the rook, whoops, sorry. <laughs> that was unintentional. Uh, attacking the rook, tagging the knight, getting the queen outside of this pawn chain so that the move c4 is completely useless. And against rook e1, we enter sort of the tactical stage, c4. This is where things get really cool. Lots of you asked, doesn't this win the queen, right? Doesn't this win the queen? Well, it, it does in the strict sense, right? Semantically speaking, because he can't take the bishop, he's pinned. But after king f7, who can explain to me what the problem is? Why, why aren't we just winning the queen? You lose yours. Your queen is also hanging. That is Tunnel Vision. Welcome to Tunnel Vision City. We are going to be tackling Tunnel Vision 24-7, 365 days a year. Tunnel vision is when you get fixated on one particular al aspect or element of the position, element of the position, and you ignore others. And that is one of the most common problems at various, various gradations of it afflict, not only beginners, but, but grandmasters as well. Um, it's, 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 it's less a particular weakness than a set of, of mistakes under one umbrella is how I would call it. Uh, so for that reason, we play bishop takes c4. Then, again, if we play bishop g5, he goes king f7. So we take the knight. And king f6 is the big mistake. He should have played king f7. The reason he didn't play it, I think, um, is, is because he was afraid of queen takes c4 check. But what move does black have here? What nasty little move does black have here? And I'm going to ask you guys two questions in succession. D5 is correct. Four. Does white lose the rook? And if not, can you propose a way that white can salvage the rook here? So there's a couple of pro... No. There is a way to salvage. There's, there is many ways to salvage the rook. One is to... When you are in a fork, what kinds of things do you look for to get out of the fork? Like what? Let's think about it generally. Couple of things. First thing you can do is move one of the pieces away with check. That is the most robust way of dealing with a fork. Well, apart from taking the piece that's delivering the fork, which is not possible here. So you can move the rook away with check and then move the queen and take the pawn. You're good. You could also move one of the pieces and use tactics to disallow taking the other piece, the queen b3. That would keep the pawn pinned. Or you could do an EST equal or stronger threat Queen takes c4 would be an example of that. Essentially, that means you are posing or using an equal or stronger threat to defend against the initial threat. And the equal or stronger threat is the fact that you would win the queen. So you can actually do more than three. You can do even more than that. But those are three examples of ways that you can deal with force. That's what tactics is. And the more you expose yourself to tactics and to these kinds of concepts, the better you become, the more fluent you become in this particular language. Um, and this is high level stuff. Tactics are very hard. And there's many aspects to, tr to mastering tactical thinking, one of which is just solving thousands and thousands of exercises 
to train your pattern recognition. The best one would probably, meh, hard for me to say. Rook f4 check probably is the safest. Okay, uh, so instead my opponent walked into this tactic, but really his decisive mistake was not to play d5 here. And had he played d5 here, I would have done much the same thing as before. You could play queen takes d4, rook f4 check. I would probably go queen takes d4. I think the best move, I mean, the best move is probably just to go rook f4 and then queen takes d4. And if you count the material, white is up two pawns and his king is in shambles. So we're still winning here. Um, okay. And you can see how complicated chess becomes when you've got king on f6 and hanging queen. You're, this is not imaginary. You know, this is actual complexity and it's stuff that we will deal with together. And I hope to arm you with some of the tools that you can use to wade through some of this sort of anarchy on the board. Um, so questions, does, does, that, does that make sense? Once he gives up his queen, the game is over. And by the way, the last thing I was gonna say is the move queen f7 is actually the fastest mate here, technically speaking, and checkmate with a pawn h3. Um, and, and that would be the fastest mate. We did queen d5 check and queen g5. Technically, black can prolong the game one more move with knight e5. Now, you might look at this and say, well, Daniel, how did you know to look for queen f7, right? And as I said earlier, there are so many resources now where you could just go to puzzles, click on mate in one. You can literally filter puzzles by mate in one and you solve 50 of them do that for a week and imagine how much better you're going to become at recognizing these patterns, right? So a lot of the time that people, I think, get confused about, about training, right? About, about what they need to do to get to the next level. The, the answer is just to, to solve, right? And the rest is just going to come because I think the, the misconception people think, well, I don't know a key fact or a key way of thinking that is preventing me from getting to the next level. That's why I'm wondering. Often the reason isn't that you don't know something, it's that you don't know how to apply it and you just gotta give yourself more practice, okay? Um, I'm not saying that's always the case, but that's one thing that you can sort of apply. All right, 